She's just very impressive with how she's functioned. And I'm having like serious FOMO because she's selling to you but has not tried to sell to me and I'm having FOMO How do you know it. that getting on this podcast wasn't her way of getting to you so she could sell She doesn't even know why she's here. What are you talking about? <laughs> she would need to be more targeted in her prospecting. She knows who you are. She's listened to several <laughs> of our episodes so she already has done her research. I've done lots of research on you, Gina. Oh, <laughs> God, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm super excited about you guys hearing this episode with a local sales representative. Her name is Rachel Van Rensselaer, and hopefully I got that right because I get it wrong about 10 times in this episode. But she is a sales representative with WMBF News, which is an NBC affiliate TV station in Myrtle Beach. And she oh my just God. really impressed me because she just nails the sales process. Nailing the sales process is what I've experienced with her. She's super cool. She moved to Myrtle Beach to go to college at Coastal Carolina University, and she received her degree in only three years I believe as a communication it. major uh, with minors in new media and digital culture and creative writing. And she really is super creative. And you'll see in this she episode is. that she thinks like her the way that she thinks is just like it's like peeled off the pages of of fanatical prospecting it's no just kidding. incredible it's incredible and what's great is she doesn't she doesn't really even she realizes it but yet it it isn't creepy and salesy and the way that you would think when you learn some of these techniques it's just it flows really well and and you'll see she's in a sales process with me and that's why we brought her on and i i don't i feel nothing but like a good feeling with dealing with her in her sales process and i think that's one thing that holds salespeople back from prospecting is you're worried you're going to be like it's not going to go well and it's you're going to be creepy or whatever but there's a way to do it literally textbook and come across fantastic like she does she is awesome. Um, I, I think I said this in the episode. I got a little bit of a girl crush on her because I just think I'm enamored with her and her abilities and her personality. And she really nails it. And she talks a lot about curiosity. And um, while she works for a TV station, she is not selling TV commercials. I'm not going to tell you what she's selling because you need to listen to her approach because I think it's brilliant. And if salespeople take the same approach that she does, that's what it's all about. Easy peasy. And I know you guys are used to hearing Gina and I interview the rock stars of the sales world. And I'm here to tell you that Rachel Van Rensselaer is a rising rock star in the sales world. So let's listen to this episode with her and enjoy. Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of Women Your Mother Warns You About. The podcast that makes business sexy again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rachel Pitts, the singing lender. <laughs> and I'm Gina Tremarco, master sales trainer at Sales Gravy, pretending to be sexy, Rachel. <laughs> uh, is my voice that sexy? That's so hot. <laughs> That's what you do every time. You I have try that. to. We're and you totally going to disrupt our audience. You know why I do that is I was at a, actually a sales conference. It was a Tom Ferry sales conference. And we were talking about your normal tone of voice that you use when you make a sales call. Because a lot of people are like, hey, this is Rachel and I'm calling because just, uh, you know, and it does, it, it's off putting right away because you know, that's a salesperson. So we were talking about just t speaking in your normal tone. And some people have a high voice and some people have a medium voice. And then every once in a while, there's the low voice, which is actually mine when I speak in my normal talking voice. And I've always felt self-conscious about that until I was selected and I happened to be wearing a very hot red dress that day. Um, I was selected as the example of the low speaking voice. And I got on the mic and said, hi, I'm Rachel Pitts. And every, and I forget, I said something else too. And everybody just died. And the whole rest of the conference, I was the hot chick in the red dress with the sexy voice. And I, it was very eye opening that when you are yourself, it's the most effective. So 
anyway, all that story <laughs> as a brief introduction to somebody who is very good at using her authentic voice. And that is Rachel Van Rens. Oh, man, I can't even say Van Rensselaer. I'll just come help out. Van there. Rensselaer. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I was really confident that I could nail it. And then I lost confidence at the last second. The other Rachel, just introduce yourself. There, the other Rachel. Uh, Welcome to the go. show. The other white meat. Did I say that? I did. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm the other Rachel, as we were joking about earlier, we get double trouble of Rachel on the show today. Thank you so know. much for joining us, Rachel. And she actually, Rachel does not even actually know why she's here right now. Yeah. And she really, we, she does she truly not know? No. Are you serious? <laughs> no. Nope. She gave me like a short preface and kind of said like, hey, We'd love to have you on the podcast, and I have no idea why, but I was like, I, I will never turn down an opportunity. Okay, yeah. I thought I did tell you in a quick well, conversation why, and and that's because, <laughs> and I'll tell you the full story in a minute, but it's because your sales skills are so impressive to me, knowing what I know from being on this side of, of, of things in the sales training environment with Sales Gravy. I mean, you are, there's so much that people can learn from what you have been doing. And, and just so you know, Warners, Rachel is selling to me. So her sales skills are so impressive that she's still selling to me and eventually will be successful as she navigates the sales process. But she's just very impressive with how she's functioned. And wait, and I'm having like serious FOMO because I'm like, she's selling to you, but has not tried to sell to me. And I'm like, I'm having fun. How do you over know it? that getting on this podcast wasn't her way of be getting to you so she could sell? She doesn't to you. even know why she's here. What are you talking about? <laughs> she would need to be more targeted in her prospecting. She knows who you are. She's listened to several of our episodes, so she already has done her research. I've done lots of research on you, Gina. I have done. <laughs> oh God, I'm scared. <laughs> she she will she will get you soon enough, but um, before we get to all of that. Let's find out one important thing, Rachel, and that is, would you consider yourself a woman your mother warned you about? Um, I would say yes. I think my my mother would even say yes. Uh, and just in general, she would say yes. I was actually talking to her about it earlier and trying to explain to her. I mean, even just the idea of explaining a podcast to my mother is like speaking foreign language. And then you explain it as like, no, it's, it's this podcast called women your mother warned you about. And she was like, oh yeah, you'll fit right in. Yeah. <laughs> you'll fit right in. Thanks, um, mom. Yeah. And, and the reason why I, and I talked to her a little bit about it and I think it's just overall, I don't like the word no a lot. And I will do anything I can to make a no a yes. And and sometimes that's not what a mom wants to hear. Like you're supposed to just follow the rules all the time. And I'm not you're supposed I, to be a good girl. Yeah, I'm not. I can't. I I I sometimes I can't play by the book. I, I'm curious, Rachel V. I'm just gonna have to do that through this podcast. Where did you get this inclination to be like, mm, not taking a no? Where'd it come from? It's it's been that way ever since I was a kid. Out of the womb, as soon as you got out of your mother's womb. Yeah, I've always been very, very bullheaded. And and it's a it's a blessing and a curse sometimes, I think. It's the only way I can explain it. Well, I think it's a blessing. <laughs> Thank 100%. you. percent Speaking Thank as one you. of those women. So um Rachel, Rachel P. Um, we need, so why did we bring Rachel V on this show? Because something very specific happened that you're like, we need to put her on the show. Yep. So I'll just walk through up until current <laughs> Rachel V's sales process with me. And it went a little like this. First, Rachel V was, she reached out to me via Facebook Messenger and said that she'd been studying or checking out my marketing pieces for the singing lender. And she pointed out that it was really fun and it was really different. And she'd love to have a conversation with me about possible opportunities with WMVF, which is a local television station. That's an NBC affiliate. And I was like in the middle of stuff. And I just saw the message and, and messaged back. Absolutely. Here, just give me a shout at your convenience. Gave her my phone number. Immediately called me. 
like immediately called me, which is really important for any type of online lead situation. Because if somebody responds to you, like now is the best time because in 20 minutes, I'm on to something else. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was really top of mind. So she called me right away and we talked a little bit about um, just what I do. She's, she obviously had done her research and knew what I did. And um, I gave her the classic brush off. I'm like, great, great, great. That sounds good. Just email me something over. <laughs> and the Ray typical brush off. Yep. Total typical brush off. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard. And it was a hard brush off. Like, no, nope, email. Yeah, just send me, just nope. send me your material. Got to go. Yep. And Rachel pushed back and said, I don't really like to email proposals over without getting to know you a little better. And mm. then she asked for the appointment. She said, and specifically was like, would you like to meet for coffee? And I think you did. You might have even said next Tuesday because otherwise yeah, you said she was specific. She was like textbook specific. Yeah. So she said, which was good because I could. And this is the this is the lesson that I want everybody to learn is when she said, can you because I'm like busy up to my eyeballs like everybody else out there and i have i don't have any time for you but if you say tuesday at 10 30 then i'm like oh you know what that does work so i agreed to the meeting and as soon and then we figured out a place as soon as i hung up within about five minutes maybe less she had sent me the calendar invite and then she, the morning of, I think that I received an email as well as a text, just as a reminder of our meeting. Are you going to be there? Also like all great things. Uh, then when we had the meeting, there were a few things that stuck, struck, stuck out to me that Rachel did in the conversation. Cause I was all over the place and like, blah, 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 and like running late, I think. And, and, and Rachel did a really good job of continuing. And every time she did it, I noticed it continuing to pull the conversation back from whatever squirrel I had ran off with to what her objective was. That and is not easy to do. Not with me with coffee involved. Like, I was like, <laughs> and, but, but she did a really good job of it, um, of continuing to drive towards the goal, which was to find out if there was an opportunity there to get me and my company to buy into putting the singing lender on, um, news the news channels because that's actually a pretty good demographic for mortgage and she even did a classic takeaway which was like i mean i didn't even know if this meeting would come to anything or if it i just wanted to see if this conversation would see if the idea had legs like it was like total classic takeaway of like there's no pressure here um then she also drilled down to the fact that i'm i'm actually not necessarily the decision maker and the main stakeholder like she was trying to get to the other stakeholders which is i mean it like just yes corporate has more money than me so we yep. might want to talk to the people higher up that have more money than me that might want to you know buy into this idea and give their thoughts so then I even pushed back again I was like yeah can you put something together a proposal and she's like yeah well let's first talk to the next stakeholder, which was my branch manager, scheduled an appointment. And actually, he'd been out of town. So I told her he'll be back on Monday, but Monday, he ain't going to see your email because there'll be, I think he gave the count yesterday that literally he had like 2,700 yep. emails that Monday morning. So it was good. You didn't try to pitch yours in there. And I said, reach out to him Tuesday or even Wednesday. So then we got that meeting scheduled. Then a couple of days ago, we had that meeting finally with Mike um, to talk about next steps. And still, still, there hasn't really been, there's been a broad number put on the table, but not a committed number that like, this is the price. But there's been a little bit of talk, but there's been no proposal on paper put in front of us yet because we're still trying to move through that discovery phase of like, what's going to work. Yeah. But um Again, like every time, all of the important things. Oh, I forgot one piece. By the time I was putting my car into drive from that first meeting with Rachel, she had texted me a thank you. So there was that piece. But all these things, like if you're wondering how to conduct a perfectly executed 
sales experience for somebody that is good and it feels good for me and it's not pressure, but we know that we have a common goal, like go back and re-listen to what I just said about how Rachel operated because (laughs) it's like so spot on. And you know, what's also interesting about that is she prospected you even though you might not be interested or be in the market for what she's selling. Oh yeah. I never thought it's it's created. It's creating the need. It's creating the demand for what she has. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, two things to point out a, you had mentioned that, you know, we've, we've gone two and a half weeks into this and there's no proposal on the table. Like a media buying sales process takes so long. And that's just such a normal thing that I'm used to at this point. Like most of the time, to get to the main decision maker that's going to write the check, it's going to take me a month. So that that's pretty normal at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and to compare your process to another vendor that I've spoken to recently, who she had a phone call conversation with me mm-hmm. and I gave her the blow off. Or actually, I actually it was the opposite because it was an inbound call because I was interested in her company. I'd been told like they do good work and I called her she gave me like a, you know, 10, 15 minute phone call and answered some questions. And I said, yeah, just send me over a proposal. She did send me over a proposal. And I looked, I was like, words, 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 scroll, 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 number. Ah! Ah! And then ran away. And I like, was like, that's too expensive. I'm not doing that. So that's the reaction that people have when you send them a bunch of fucking verbiage and then a number that is it's always more than they want to spend. If it's more than like zero, like it's more yeah, than they yeah. want to ever spend. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and Jeb preaches this all the time. Like we could like probably get our hands slapped big time for sending out proposals without having a meeting. And it's like, it's just not allowed. And I had a, like a third discovery call today with someone who you know, he missed his meeting yesterday and then we had to reschedule and then he couldn't make that. And then he had to reschedule to today. And he was like, well, just go ahead and send the proposal in advance for me to look at. And I didn't, I just didn't. I said, I actually took the proposal, took out the pricing and said, here's what I was thinking you should do. Here's a training idea. Here's a coaching idea. And I'm like, and I took the prices out. Like I'll give you an idea so that we can jump into the call, but I'm not about to do the pricing. Right. It's an easy way to get the appointment canceled. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at that point, like for me, what I've learned a lot is that if you just send an email, you have no, like there's no value to that. Like you haven't explained why that price and that number has value and how you're going to get that ROI either. So. Yeah. Yeah. And and you can't convince you once, like I looked at that woman's proposal and see what she didn't know is I had insider information there's another company similar to mine that's using her service and I already knew what she was charging them. Right. And what she sent me was literally like three times what I knew she was charging the other guy. So then it pissed me off as well. Cause I'm like, and of course she said in her email and in her conversation, this is just a starting point. And then I'm like, well, uh, if the fucking starting point is three times what you're charging these other guys, then why is this like what it's just it it, so it it gave me a a bad taste in my mouth about this company that ultimately i did want to do business with right at the at the price i heard (laughs) that reminds me warners of an episode several episodes back about a certain local computer repair shop i shall leave nameless but go listen to that episode where talk about baiting and switching right they they, they started at one high price that was like $1,000 and then all of a sudden went to $79. That is a really great way to piss somebody off to not spend money with you. Oh, God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, let's rewind a little bit to Rachel V. Um, let's go because in your in your bio, it mentions that you grew up in a funeral home. So I want to know how... A, a amazing salesperson grew up in a funeral home and how you came from that to who you are now. Well, I mean, there's a lot that I could pack in there. There's a, but, but yeah, I grew up in a funeral home from the day I was born. Uh, my dad actually grew up in the same house that I grew up in. So he, my dad is the third generation uh, business owner for the funeral home. He runs the entire thing himself. My mom helps a little bit. Um, but 
I mean, I grew up in a really, really small, small town where everybody knew everybody. And um, yeah, I just, I just watched my dad grow that business and he was really well respected in the community because of what he did. And I think that has a lot to do with who I am in business now too. I mean, especially just with the way you communicate with people, you have to be very meticulous, especially with, I mean, for him, it was you know, funeral services and things like that, where you have to, you just have to be really careful about the way you talk to people. And I've been very conscious of that as I move forward into moving to Myrtle beach, I guess. Okay. So did you see it? How old were you when you saw a dead body for the first time? That's the, that's the kind of information <laughs> I want to know. My dad's also the corner of the town. So I went on my first corners call probably at like 12, 13, 14, maybe. But I mean, I, I had been helping since I was little. So I, I couldn't tell you the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just normal. <laughs> like, well, it's, it's just fascinating to me. Like yeah. <laughs> so many people fear death. But when you're kind of around it and you're like, I mean, it's just you know, a dead body. It's not going to leap up and get you, like, yeah. it's, you know. Yeah. And, and I never knew the people like growing up really until I was in my mid teens. That's when I started like putting everything together. Um, but that's when I had a lot of even more respect for my dad. Cause I saw him and how he would communicate and talk to the people that were close to me, whether it was a friend of mine that lost a parent or a family friend, whatever it was, my, my dad just had a really, really good way of communicating and being sensitive and, and valuing their time and all of mm-hmm. that. Well, that makes, that makes for a really good salesperson. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. All, all of those things. Yeah. I, you, you, you referenced that, um, you learned to not ever take no for an answer. I'm like, I'm, I, I'm just so morbid. I'm like, did you practice that on? <laughs> they can't say no to me. They're no, not going to say no. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if those two things have anything in common. I think that I've just always been bullheaded. And I think it's, some, <laughs> it's the thing that they least like about me. Like, it's, oh my gosh. they don't like it that much because I just always was very, very bullheaded. And it was kind of my way or the highway. Um, you may say, but I've grown from that as a kid into now just now I, I have a lot of uh, like, I, I want to bring my ideas to fruition. And that's why I don't like the word no anymore. But before it was just being stubborn, maybe. Hi, this is Jeb Blunt. There's a reason why thousands of sales professionals and top companies across the globe honed their sales skills at Sales Grove University. You see, Salesgrave University is different than most learning platforms. First, we have live courses taught in a virtual classroom by our master trainers that start almost every single day. And our e-learning platform is populated with hundreds of hours of sales training content produced by some of the top sales trainers in the world, including Gina's spontaneous selling course, which is worth checking out. Now, I've got some good news. If you've never taken a course on Salesgrave University, if you're a new user, you can take your very first course for free. That's any course on the platform, absolutely free. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com or click the e-learning tab in the top menu at salesgravy.com. Pick out your course. And when you check out, use coupon code free course to get that course for free. That is free course to get your very first course for free. Well, and I think it's a good quality in a salesperson because you don't have a way about you of like taking offense or anything that you don't. And of course, you mentioned you're in a slow sales process with with me and with your clientele. But there's a lot of salespeople that do take offense or they take it personally to get the no rather than your approach, which is a really important approach to develop, which is. A no means really not now. Yeah. And so you don't know when someone might change their mind or if it's just really a price objection. And instead of taking it personally and like scurrying off into the kitchen for a snack to hide, like right. then you just go, okay, so what, what's, what can we do? Yeah. And, and that's one big thing that I've learned. I mean, I'm still kind of, I wouldn't call myself a rookie anymore, but I'm definitely new to the sales industry. I've only been in sales for about two and a half years now. So um, I'm still learning, but the one big thing that I have learned is that when people say no, they're like you said, whether it's a price objective or whatever, 
there, there is a reason they're saying it. So if you can uncover that reason and address that just by asking a lot of questions, then usually that no will turn into a yes. You, it's just being able to ask those right questions. So something for me that's always been helpful is just by staying curious with my just. Ooh, I just said this this morning in an interview I did. It's that being curious and being playful. Yeah. When, you're cur- when you're genuinely curious because you want to like really understand people, yeah. it comes off authentically. It doesn't come off as salesy if you're like, oh, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. People are more likely to start sharing information with you. I'm curious because you said you've only been in sales for two and a half years. Yeah. Where in the world did you get this training <laughs> that makes you kind of textbook? Um, so I have like, well, I work with WMBF. We're the NBC affiliate, but we're owned by Gray Television. And they do a lot of sales training in-house there. And they have this whole um, great training team. Um, and there's two really great people. Um, Mims Goza, she's a huge mentor for me, and Steven Naylor. And they both, you know, they when I first started in sales, they sent me to Charlotte for an entire week where I met with Mims and, and worked with Steven and the, the corporate team. And we, we dove in and it was a week of nonstop training. Like it, it was for a lot of people, I think it was very overwhelming. Um, and for me, I ate it up. I really did. I loved it. Um, and, and I've stayed in contact with them and continue to sharp. I try to sharpen my training skills as much as I can by, by working with them and, and listening to things like podcasts and doing all that. So I've stayed like, I've stayed curious the whole time. Oh, and you know, there, there are other things like sales gravy university. Yeah. You could, you you could sign up for an all access pass and be learning all year. Things like that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I had to do that. Sorry. I I, I appreciate You're funny that you did it because I just wrote (laughs) down like, Thank you to our sponsor, Sales Gravy, and Jeb Blunt, the sponsor of this podcast. There you go. Nice mid roll. Yeah. Eventually, those textbook things have definitely become way more natural. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. Because I like observing what you were doing. It wasn't, honestly, Rachel, it wasn't obvious. It's just that. I'm really tied in with sales training right yeah. now. My perspective is really open to that. And right. I was like, damn, yes. she just like pulled my conversation back in so effectively. <laughs> like it was so good. That's where the true talent comes in is, yeah, we recognize when I say textbook, we recognize the things that we teach and we preach to be anti sales but to be confident, assertive to the point to get the business yeah. and to understand how to have the right sales process. And you want to do it in a way where the buyer's not feeling like you have a sales process. So we recognize your process and we're like, okay, she's actually doing it right. She is. And if there was ever a real, a textbook version of relaxed, assertive confidence that Jeb talks about, it was Rachel on the sales call the other day with uh, my branch manager. I was watching it because it was really a conversation between those two. Yeah. And I was like, she's so chill right now. And she's like, I'm going to casually ask a question that has nothing to do with any of this. Yeah. Like, Who knows? Maybe one day, maybe one day we'll steal her over to sales gravy. Oh, Lord. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We're growing the Myrtle Beach offices. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, I all I know is that right now I you know, I have learned so much over the last two and a half years and I know that I have so much more to learn. But um kind of talking to the sales process that you were explaining is there I'm sure there are things that I've been taught that I don't do that just don't work for me. Like you really just have to find out what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Would you say that you learned more about business and sales? during your college year time, college year time, or in that week that you spent with the sales training company that you just mentioned? Oh man. Um, I learned a lot both in both situations in college. I was also working uh, heavily in part-time with an advertising agency. Um, so I was getting hands-on experience with, and I was working with the, the owner over there. And I mean, she, she hustles harder than anyone I had ever met. And I, and I, really looked to her as a mentor and got training from her. And that was throughout college. 
But then throughout the training that I had in Charlotte with my corporate team, like it just opened my eyes to all of the opportunities out there. And, and I had, that was when I learned how to be flexible because I work in media sales. Like one day I'm talking to a mortgage lender. And then in the afternoon, I have a meeting with a funeral home, believe it or not, that, that day I had a meeting with a funeral home later that day. And then the next day I might be meeting with a jewelry store. And then I meet with a car dealer. So that was when I learned how to be able to shift conversations before I was kind of like learning a little bit about the process in advertising and selling advertising in general. But in, in training is when we got into the nitty gritty of like learning how to sell to everybody. How to sell to everybody. That know, yeah, is, that's... Now, if there's not a title for the next book for somebody. <laughs> how to sell. Oh, I How I like to sell that. to everybody.com. Better go buy it. Oh, my <laughs> go God. Buy it. There she goes. There she goes with the jump. We got don't we have a domain addiction yeah. over here. You are you are selling to everybody. I'm curious. Is any of it inbound leads or are you out, out hunting? I would say that 97 percent of it is hunting. And yeah. calling. Yeah. So what's your what's your process for hunting? So how are you developing your list for uh, for prospects? Um, really, I go by a category. So when I ran into Rachel's uh, Facebook and the videos on Facebook, the how I got there was I was looking at mortgage companies all over Myrtle Beach just because I have been aware that, you know, refinances have been huge right now. And, and I had done a little bit of research on why that was a good type of category to work on. And then from there, I found her videos and had a creative idea. So for me, when it comes to hunting and prospecting, I start with an overall broad, broad category. And then from there, I break it down to businesses and trying to come up with specific ideas for each of them, because no one wants to buy a commercial schedule but they want to buy an idea. And that's one thing that I've learned. Like I came to Rachel with an idea and that's why we were able to have a conversation. If I had called her and said, I want to put you in the today show, she would have been like, no, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> like, no. Unless you were putting her on the today show for an right. interview yeah. live. Yeah. Then and that that's would... out of my reach. It's a little bit out of my range. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. I love that. Warners. Did you hear that? She's, she wasn't selling, she wasn't selling TV commercials. She was selling an idea. Yeah, because it's what was the what was the idea you were selling her? Well, I had seen the 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 singing lender videos, and I just kept thinking about like it is on Facebook right now, where a very very small audience is seeing that. What would happen if we made this video into a thirty second spot and put it in front of ten times the amount of people? Oh, that just gave me goosebumps. But I I, got, I was so excited about it when I called too, and and that's what I try and do is when I'm when I'm putting an idea in front of somebody and making the phone call or messaging the person on Facebook or sending the email. I honestly just want to let them know that this is something I think would work. Do you think it would work too? Because I'm not a professional in mortgage lending. I have no idea. Maybe I'm, my audience would be the completely wrong demo, but it might also be the best. I have no idea until I have that conversation with you. And I try and be very, very open about that, that we won't know until we try. Well, and what's really interesting about it is like, if anybody has seen my videos that she's talking about, which if you need to, you can go on Facebook or <laughs> Instagram at <laughs> The Singing Lender. I put everybody in my office. <laughs> and um, I sp have spent a lot of time, effort, and money on these things yeah. with the hopes of a lot of people seeing them. And, and Rachel is right that there's only a certain amount. I mean, I just actually don't have the bandwidth personally to figure out how to target on Facebook. And um, sure. I didn't really think about that idea, that angle of the idea until Rachel called me and presented like to take, I mean, I have like seven or eight videos at this point and two in the works and like, why not take 30 seconds out of it and be in front of what is a really great demographic for um, mortgage and refinance. And once she started telling me about her idea and she was legitimately excited about it because they're like, most mortgage lenders just don't have a face for TV. Like they just, no. it's like boring. And I was dying when you said that. So I like, and what I do is definitely fun and different and would be, it's like good quality commercial material of like, that's actually a pretty good commercial, like the singing lender. And then it's in their yeah. head, you know, but she presented it in a way that was like, 
made me go, oh, that is a good idea. And then she said, well, how, how are you getting to people on Facebook? Because she's got that. She can offer me that too, that she can yeah. take my stuff on Facebook and get it more visible. So like when, when, as a salesperson, she presented this to me, it's a good learning that sometimes you cold call people and they don't know they need your idea. No, most people, I mean, any, whether I'm calling somebody because I have an idea for a Google campaign or a commercial campaign, which, you know, we have a ton of products that I can sell, but people don't realize that they need it until you they're on the phone with you. That happens all of the time. And a lot of people don't realize I have the ability to uh, help them with more than just commercial advertising or something like that. So, um, yeah, a lot of times I just got to make a phone call and see if it goes somewhere. I was going to ask that question too, because back in the day, probably before you were born, yeah. um, I was a media buyer. Okay. So, so I bought a lot of TV yeah. and, you know, back then, like things were just, they were just trying to sell, um, the whole online internet yeah. advertising banner ads. Like they were just starting that process back then, but you know, the, the focus was on the airtime. And I'm just curious how, you know, right now during this economic time, especially during the pandemic, how you've been able to go out and sell when you've got less and less eyeballs on the actual TV screen. Well, um, the first thing I, I will say is we actually saw an increase in those eyeballs during the pandemic because yeah. so many people were at home. So that was a huge win for us. Um, and the, especially in the news category, people were tuning in more than they yeah. were. Yeah. So that was wonderful. But um, Gina, do you live in Myrtle Beach? You do, correct? Uh, yeah, Myrtle's Inlet, yeah. Yeah, so we are living in Myrtle Beach, we have a huge um, market of retirees. And those are the people that are watching the news. So it's worked really well in my favor because I go after businesses that target retirees. When it comes to TV, that's who I go after, whether it's home improvement or really anything to do with the home, that's going to be a retiree. But outside of that, um, I also have the ability to handle things like digital marketing, whether it's Google campaigns or Facebook campaigns or streaming television. So I, I, when I sit down with somebody, I might have an idea, it might work, it might not, but I might uncover that they need something else. So if TV isn't the best solution for them, maybe a Google campaign is. So I try and be, I try to pivot and, and figure out what the need is. How did you handle, because I'm sure this came up for you, how did you handle businesses saying, because you're like, hey, we got more eyeballs. This yeah. is a great time to advertise. And now you're dealing with businesses that were being pummeled, you know, from closure and lack of revenue and all those businesses that were hurting financially who couldn't afford to do any advertising. How did you deal with that? Because that had to be a, a huge objection. Um, it it definitely was in the beginning. I, I remember the first two weeks of the pandemic, everyone was on freak out mode because they didn't know what was going to happen. So people were pulling their advertising. They weren't buying all of that. And um, that's, that's when I really dove into training the hardest. And, and I reached out to my resources mm. to figure out what I needed to be doing to make this work during this time. And it took, it took like two or three weeks to figure it out. But what I did was I just shifted because not every single business was struggling. Like not every single business True. was having that issue. Some businesses were busier than ever before. Yep. Like the, there are, were sunroom companies and pool companies that were still working and they couldn't, they couldn't get jobs done fast enough because people were at home and finally had oh, I I know some I know a sunroom company that was yeah. just over the top busy. Yeah. They still are. They still mm -hmm. are. And yeah, and never and they're still and they're months behind because they're, yeah. you know, they're dealing with more business than they can yeah. handle because people are remodeling. It quickly became the conversation of no, now we're too busy. Like that actually became the problem that I was having. Ah, the yeah, we don't, we don't need to advertise. We got more money than yeah. we know to do with. Yeah, please yeah. don't send any more of people our way. <laughs> yeah, of anything, that was the ob objection for the companies I was calling on because I was calling on the ones that were already hot. Like there were businesses, especially in South Carolina, that had their record years in 2020. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. those are the ones I was calling on. And then they became, we're too busy or we can't find employees. Like that was the two things. Yeah. But, and then, and then where did you shift after that? Well, when I heard we don't have employees, I came up with recruiting campaigns of ah. recruiting campaigns on Facebook, things like that, where we can target 
um, people that have, you know, that have the demo that you're looking for in an employee. And then when it came to, um, we're too busy, I, I brought up the idea of like, well, what are you going to do when things get back to normal? Like, how are people going to remember your brand and just shifting to branding rather than, um, like sales and discounts or something like that. Okay. Warners do you hear this. So this is such a key in, in sales and in selling is really identifying and uncovering the problem. So like when you get the objection of like, we're too busy, we don't, we don't need your service. What else can you do to offer them a different solution to a different problem that you th- what you thought? Because a lot of times the salespeople, we go in with like, oh, we think this is your problem and this is how we can solve it. When the reality is, is that most companies have a couple different solutions Yeah. and they have solutions they don't even know that they have if they're willing to be creative and come up with an idea. Yeah. Like Rachel's talking about. And, and like with the recruiting thing, that was a whole different department. Then I went from talking to the marketing person to the HR person. Like, ah. well, we don't have a marketing budget for that, but the HR person does for a recruiting campaign. We yes. can that happen. So it, you just have to be able to pivot. Like, that's all I know. One we thing. love the we love the word pivot. Yeah. I know. I told you you'd like her, Gina. <laughs> we love the I love her. I know. And and also, what's really wonderful is like any of y'all boomers out there that are like down and on the younger generation like this girl's been in sales for two years two and a half years whatever (laughs) she's 24 years old and like i'm just so impressed with you like i you know eventually in terms of like between you and me we'll work something out for sure but like i just am impressed with the sales skills and that it is possible to be a 24 year old and be crushing sales like my branch manager mike as well he's a 20 he's maybe 27 I think he's like a baby too and he's just so brilliant with his marketing and how he does his like Facebook posts and how he connects with people and it's there's definitely the the younger generation is not without skills I've noticed especially because I do a lot of coaching at sales gravy and I have a lot of younger salespeople that I'm coaching in their 20s and early 30s and it's been really fascinating to see like it's a whole new crop of young salespeople coming up that are like hungry high performing thirsty to learn they want to get out there and do it so anybody who's poo-pooing a younger generation like I've just been running into rock star after rock star and it it is so cool to see that happening that's really that's really exciting for me the scariest part was actually getting into the idea of sales like I never knew a single person that grew up saying like I want to go in sales one day like that wasn't me absolutely not like I I had no clue here's the cool thing about sales is like that's the place to make money yeah and I I figured that out quick and after that it was game over right well, you're like <laughs> I, I'm gonna make the most money ever if I'm selling Right. right. And everybody also forgets that every job is a sales job. And, and some people learn it faster than others. So take it from Rachel <laughs> Van Rensselaer. Van Rensselaer. Is that right? Close. <laughs> Van Rensselaer. Oh, you know what? what? If you want me to, <laughs> you know. Say it again. I mean, yay! I'm happy it's you and not me this time because we're <laughs> always making fun of me butchering names. Now the roles have reversed. And well, legit, it's a kind of there's a like a thousand letters in it. Van Rensselaer. <laughs> Slayer. Slayer. Van Rensselaer. Van Rensselaer. <laughs> I, I have one other comment to make before we wrap it up. Um, because she was talking about shifting over to recruiting, um, from marketing to recruit to HR. So this is the other thing that I like to encourage salespeople to think about, uh, especially young salespeople with less experience. I saw this happen in the beginning of the pandemic. I started calling clients and prospects and just doing like, hey, what's going on? And it tried to get yeah. information. And a lot of the information I was gathering was we think we're shifting away from training because we know we're not going to have money for training, but we're actually spending a ton of money in, cons- in in consulting on, right? So when you think about, if you if you think about who you're selling to, every company has a budget and yep. they have something called line items, right? The line items in a budget is the expense categories. Mm-hmm. And what I started running into was we have no budget for training, but we have budget for consultants, 
and lawyers and like all of that, you know, consult lawyers and CPAs and all that fall under professional consultants in a budget. And so it's just a, it's a budget numbers game. And so if you go in creatively and say, Hey, we can call this consulting. Yeah. Right. And we can call this recruiting dollars, right? You can, if you're, because the first thing cut is marketing and training. Yeah. When times are tough. Yep. So you, where do you shift it? Right. And so that's just another thing uh, to put out to everybody to get creative with the client. They really want to do it. They're interested. They want to buy, but they cannot get someone to sign off on the budget. Find another place in the budget. Yeah. And and like you said, um, you would just call people and say, hey, how are things going? I just did a lot of check-ins with people that I had maybe talked to uh, a couple months ago and hadn't talked to them since then because maybe they weren't ready at the time. Or I even did it with cold calls of just calling businesses that I I had ideas for and asking them, hey, the past month has been really hard. How are you dealing with it? Uh, and just listening to them because honestly, sometimes by just listening to them answer that question, I was able to uncover something and set a meeting because oh God. I had an idea. I think I have a girl crush on her. <laughs> I'm telling you. You, this was good. You brought, you know, you make fun. So <laughs> there have been over the years, Rachel's like, so Gina recommended a guest. I didn't know how this was going to work out. You know, I just rolled with it. And <laughs> well, I knew that I knew Rachel V was going to be great. I was um, but with it too. Cause she, she had told me, she was like, yeah, I just want to talk about your cold call process. So I was like, okay. But I also in the back of my mind, like I, in my mind, I still just started a couple of days ago. I was like, I'm a rookie. Like, what do they want me to talk about? <laughs> no idea. I'm still learning. Like, oh. Well, and that's the beauty of it is that, that yeah. that's the thing that strikes me because I could, I mean, I could tell by looking at you that you're not, you know, an old gray dog to the industry. Like you're just young and it doesn't mean that you can't be brilliant right. if you're young and if you're new, you can be brilliant on day one if you really invest in, in mm -hmm. the time and, the, and really the effort, because honestly, like all of this stuff is available. It's not just at salesgravy.university, <laughs> although it's great there, but, but there's but so the many, best. It's the best. Yeah, there's so many resources that are available to everyone, like YouTube, like everywhere you yeah. go, there's somebody, so you can learn, but you have to be, have that mindset that Rachel V has, which is like, I want to learn it all. I want to be the best I can be. How can I figure out a different way to approach this and, and find those ways that you, so that you don't, like hide behind the, the excuse of like, I'm new and I don't know what to do. Just start doing. If there's anything I can say, it's just be curious. Like, I think that's my number one thing in any, especially like introductory meeting that I have is I say the words like, out of my own curiosity, dot, dot, dot. Like I say that all the time, but that's just me genuinely being. I've, I've used that phrase a lot where I said, I am so curious about. Yeah. And then people, then other people get excited to, because they want to talk about what they do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like the phrase, tell me more. I'm yeah. like, tell, tell me more about. Yeah. And they're like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. People Thanks like to listening. talk about themselves. That's for sure. Like Rachel had asked me to talk about myself and I went on 26 tangents with it. Had to really get back in. Who is, um, who's your GM? Is it still Sarah? Um, no, it is uh, Scott Sanders. Oh, okay. Um, cause when your last GM was there, I'm like, I want a TV show. That could be the next idea you come up with. We can get our TV show launched, Rachel. Right. Remember in your last, uh, episode, you were saying that, that that's a, your five-year plan. Yeah. Is it the five-year plan? Oh, Jesus. That's what she said. It was, it was, it was in my five-year plan like four years ago. Well, <laughs> I look good now, so left. let's do it. <laughs> You look. You looked good then. What are you talking I look about? even better now because I work mm. out like crazy. Um, well, before we close up, Rachel, we have a few signature questions that we ask every guest. Okay. Um, but before that, if people want to reach out to you because they're interested in learning more about you, how can they reach you? Just. I, you know, I think it's strange to maybe say, but just like message me on Facebook if it's something you're interested in. Facebook has become a huge tool for me when it comes to prospecting um, because it's usually attached to the business owner, not the, the uh, gatekeeper. So that's been a huge way for me to get in front of people. And it's also been a way for people to get in front of me. So last few questions. First is how would you define the word sexy? Confident. That would be, that would be 
how I would describe sexy for sure. Anybody that has confidence is sexy. If you can walk into a room and own it, that's all you need. Yes. Boom, boom, pal. Own it. Short and sweet answer, but true. Short and sweet is good. We like it. It is very sexy. (laughs) What is the best advice you've ever been given? We just talked about it. Uh, staying curious. Uh, my old, my old, uh, general sales manager would tell me that all the time he would like, when I first started, I I definitely did not have the confidence yet, but he had said to me, he said, as long as you can walk into a room with curiosity, you're going to be fine. And, and that is what got me through it. And that's my favorite part of my job. Like we were talking about earlier too, like whether I'm meeting with a mortgage lender or a funeral home or a, um, a jewelry store, like a roofing company. I, there's so much that I can learn from these people and that's what I love. So the best advice I ever got was to stay curious and that's what I will continue to do. Double boom, boom, pal. And last question, any advice you wish you had been given? That your age doesn't matter. That was my biggest fear going into this role for sure is that people wouldn't take me seriously. And it took me a year to get over that. Because I would have to walk into a room and and it might be me and three men that could be my grandfathers. And I would need <laughs> to be, but truly like that has happened. Yeah. And I would yeah. have to be able to control the conversation and take command of the room. And that was, I, I, I knew I could do it, but I was really scared that people were not going to take me seriously. Yeah. I had numerous times people look at me and be like, I think it was like in my first two months, of starting in sales, I had somebody look at me a couple times and go like, I'm sorry, but I just have to ask, how old are you? And they'd cut me off mid conversation. And that really bothered me. And what did you say? I, well, oftentimes I, I would say I'm 24 and I'm really excited to be meeting with you. And like, let's, and I would just go right into the conversation. Like I, I would just move past it. Talk and about I, a red herring, like the worst yeah, that of all. Is. I'd be like, I'm 55. Yeah. Like I look was, good. I'm actually 85 and I have a magical <laughs> spell where I brush my daughter's hair every morning with this magical brush. Yeah. Wow. And, and um, actually, Sarah, who you mentioned, she at my, at my GM at the time, she kind of looked at me because I brought it to her when I went into this role. And I was like, this is something I'm really scared about. She was like, you need to get over it. Like, it's it's going to be fine. And I wish I had taken that advice more seriously mm. because it's mm. something that really got to me of like constantly being afraid that I wasn't going to be taken seriously. Totally. And I will say when I met, because the sales process was so professional, I it really didn't occur to me to think about your age at all, Rachel, yeah. until, yeah. until I was like, damn, this girl's good. Like how old <laughs> she must she be to be this good? I don't think I knew your age until this podcast because I don't care because clearly you, the sales process that you're working on is very well refined and that's the difference maker. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it has been so awesome having you on the show. Uh, Thank you for coming to the show, not knowing what was going to happen to you. Yeah, we we appreciate that. We hope uh, we hope you share this out because you definitely should be recognized as as a rock star, as a salesperson. Thank you. Um, Just from our opinion, from how we experience you and see you and how you how you, you know, hold yourself and how you carry yourself. um, You're a rock star. I appreciate that. Thank you guys for having me. This has been wonderful. And yeah, I had no idea where what direction this was going to go in, but uh, I'm happy. Good. A validating one is the direction <laughs> we were going with. Get out awesome. there and sell some stuff on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, it is time for us to wrap up this episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, sponsored by Sales Gravy. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, we loved having Rachel here with us today. If you loved the show, and you should, and you know some young salespeople, go out and share this episode because I think this is such an awesome, truly such an awesome episode. Um, not just young salespeople, but anybody who's new to selling. And there are a lot of people out there who are changing careers. I talk to them all the time. They, they leave a career of engineering and become salespeople. Right? So anybody who's new to sales, I think this episode is going to be really um, such a great listen for anybody like that. And hey, give us a rating and review because... 
We haven't asked for one in a while, so we're gonna we're gonna ask for one. I'm Gina Schmarco, master sales trainer and coach at Sales Gravy. You can find out more about me at salesgravy.com or ginatremarco.com. And handing it over to the original Rachel, Rachel OG. <laughs> Rachel Pitts. <laughs> I'm the singing lender. You can find me uh, everywhere that website and on social media for the singing lender and you can find out everything you need to know about sharing this episode and all of our previous episodes at women your mother warned you about.com we're out of here by warners this really will get serious soon yeah I don't think. it doesn't have to i don't think anybody wants it to be serious